Hi, I'm Otto Pensler. I'm in the, uh, my lavish office here in the basement of the Mysterious Bookshop in Manhattan. Uh, there, there may be a little background noise of drilling. It's either a jackhammer or a dentist. I'm not sure what it is, so we apologize for that if we can't hear it. Um, we're going to be talking today about Elmore Leonard. Um, just as a little background, I have to say that uh, El Elmore Leonard and I became very good friends uh, over time, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I wasn't terribly familiar with his books uh, because he wrote mostly westerns early in his career and then when he kind of switched over to mysteries they were paperback originals and um, back in those days I always thought really if it's any good it's going to make it into hardcover and so uh, my arrogance was uh, uh, inappropriate but then he got a uh, a hardcover publishing deal with uh, Arbor House and a book came out called City Primeval which I read and absolutely thought this guy is amazing. I was discovering uh, Elmore Leonard <laughs> although he had had a lot of books and everybody was familiar as I was uh, with the movie Ombre which was based on uh, on his uh, novel and there were other films made from his book from his books uh, but I read that, and then when I saw that a second book was coming out from Arbor House, I called to see if he was touring and would he come to the bookshop. And uh, it was a strange, you have to remember a long time ago, but I'm, I'm talking about 30 years ago or more, more like 40, uh, it was rare for mystery writers to tour. They, they weren't asked to. Uh, big bestsellers might be... Uh, but for mystery writers to go touring the country, going to bookshops and being interviewed on TV and radio and newspapers and magazines was, was virtually unknown. So when I called to see if he was uh, going to show up, uh, if he was touring, if he was coming to New York, and they said, uh, oh, uh, well, do you want him? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. And as a result, I learned from, from Elmore Leonard, from Dutch is how I always knew him, uh, that because we had asked for him, they actually sent him on a tour to New York. Um, so the, uh, when he showed up, I, I just want to take a, a book off the uh, shelf. Excuse me. When he showed up, I didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, but if you look at his picture here, he looks like a tough guy, you know? And I thought, you know, it's not uncommon for us to do events at my store where not too many people showed up. So I was concerned that this tough looking guy was going to show up and there'd be nobody there and he'd beat me up. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my old store had a spiral staircase up to the second floor which is where we would do a signing if we, if we did one. I was behind the desk. <clears throat> and while I was waiting for him, so he came up the spiral staircase. And there he is. He's got a little watchman's cap, you know, like a longshoreman. And he's squinting. And I thought, I'm, I'm so scared. And he, he came up to me and he said, You Otto? And I said, Yes, Mr. Leonard. And he said, Um... This is the first time I've ever done a signing outside of my hometown. Thank you. And he hugged me. <laughs> so I was no longer afraid of him. So we signed some books and we got to know each other pretty well. Uh, and I started to collect, I had started to collect him a little bit, but I became a little bit more eager to collect him now that I had met him and that I knew that he was going to be a major figure in America, which he quickly did become. Uh, it was very soon after City Primeval that uh, Cat Chaser and uh, Split Images and, uh, and Stick came out, which became a movie that with Burt Reynolds that he absolutely hated. Um, but um, among the things that, uh, that he did early on were these paperback originals. Ombre was a paperback original. The Big Bounce was made into a film twice. 
And Elmore Leonard said, I always thought that when I saw The Big Bounce, it was the worst movie ever made until they made the remake. <laughs> and that was worse. <laughs> so here are, here's what these, uh, some of these paperback originals look like. Uh, as you can see, the ones that are here are in perfect condition. And I did fall in love uh, <laughs> more than once in my life uh, with, with, this, uh, with this book. And uh, these, just to let you know, just to, since we're talking about collecting, uh, because of the tremendous condition of these books, this one is $65 because they're very hard to find in really nice shape. And this is, uh, this is 100 and the switch is also 100 So this is what collecting Elmo Leonard First Editions is like. You can get them for $20 or $15 if they're in crummy condition. Condition matters so much. Um, now, the Big Bounce, as I said, was a paperback original. But because I was such a huge fan, when I started doing some reprints of, of early books by writers, I did, a limp, I did a hardcover edition of The Big Bounce, which looks like this. It was largely aimed at libraries. I didn't know that too many people, if they had the opportunity to buy the paperback, would also at some point want a hardcover. So I printed them in fairly small quantities. And as a result, they're fairly uncommon. Uh, this one is inscribed to Howard Stringer, who was the uh, also a good friend of mine, who was the head of CBS at that at that time, president of CBS, and went on to be the CEO of Sony worldwide. <clears throat> and uh, he came and uh, Dutch signed that book for him. I also did of the same book. I did a limited edition like that. My my. My wife at the time, Carolyn, did the drawing of the illustration of, of Dutch. And these were limited to 100 copies, numbered, and signed. I love publishing these books. And this is, uh, this is only $100. Um, what else? Then he's... Oh, there's City Primeval that I was talking about, which is... High Noon in Detroit, really a terrific book. If you haven't read it, I heartily recommend it. Uh, 52 Pickup, when he first started getting into hardcover, uh, they were pretty uncommon. They were small quantities because, uh, you know, he had been a paperback original writer and the, the people doing them in hardcover, in this case Delacorte, uh, did fairly small print runs, so they're, they're pretty rare. This one's inscribed. Um, and the, the nice way that Delacorte uh, is helpful, it'll say, as you can see, first printing. And on a couple of the uh, Delacorte books, there was a second printing, and it'll say second printing. It doesn't leave much to, uh, to figure out. They're very helpful. They were very helpful about that. Um, Unknown Man, number 89, also one of the very early hardcover books, also Delacorte. Uh, some of these get a little more expensive. This is also inscribed, and it's $450, just to let you know. And again, that same clue that makes it a little bit easier to determine whether it's a first edition. Again, all of these books that I'm showing you came from, uh, or many of them anyway, came from a collection where the, collect the collector was very, very careful about condition. And so they're quite expensive because they're immaculate. I mean, this is a book that normally turns up with a grubby cover, the white is dirty and so on, but these are pretty much like new. Uh, and even though that was hard cover, I did it, I did a limited edition of that as well. Unknown Man number 89 in its slipcase, again, limited to 100 copies, numbered and signed. And, um, And even though it's a limited edition with only 100 copies available, it's uh, a lot less expensive than the first edition. It's also $100. Um, before that, 
I did, the Mysterious Press did some limited editions of his books, um, and there's Glitz, which I thought was a pretty glitzy cover. <laughs> I largely designed this cover myself. This is back in the day when I was doing uh, quite a lot of stuff on my own. Uh, but we did a lot of copies of this, and uh, as a result, it's, uh, it's only $50, because I think we did 250 of them, maybe more. Um, this is a cool book. This had a very small print run, as you might expect. It's his journal, his notebooks, where he would write down little phrases, uh, things that would, he would use later in his books. Um, to, and these would be his reminder. Uh, this, this is signed. But there's so many cool things in there, like the Oklahoma Turnpike fee is $3.20. I bet you never knew that. But he also uh, uh, wrote down some dialogue that he would like to use. The Mex Chow was good, too. Taco, tamale, and enchilada. And Coors. You know, it's just, he was just cool. The way he wrote things was cool. As a result, he, he won an Edgar for La Brava, which also became a very popular film. He was a grandmaster uh, and won a National Book Award for Lifetime Achievement. Um, because we had become friends, um, this is uh, an interesting book for me. He was uh, signing books in my office at, at, the, at my old bookshop, and uh, he, he loved talking about his books as he was writing them. There are some writers that I published who would never, they wouldn't even tell you the title. Ross Thomas, who I published for quite a few years, would never, would never say anything about his books. And if I asked him, he would say, you know I don't talk about my books. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. But Dutch, and this is, was not uncommon, he would like to he'd call up and say, Otto, how are you doing? Listen, I just want to, just want to say hi and, and how are you doing and so on. And I said, good, how are things go with you? He said, oh, I have a problem. I said, oh, what's your problem? He said, well, I'm up to page 130 on my new book, and my hero got killed last night. <laughs> I said, what, what do you mean? He, one of the things that he frequently did was use real life people that he knew, change them a little bit, and those became characters in his books. And so he had been talking about the real life guy, he said, oh yeah, I met this guy, you know, when I was in Texas or when I was in Oklahoma, whatever it was, and he would talk about this guy, and I'm using him in this book, and, uh, and he's a real tough guy, you know, he's dealing drugs, the real person is a nice, you know, professor or something, but he had him as a drug dealer, and he said, and he got killed last night, I said, you mean the, the guy that, down in Texas that you made, he said, no, no, my character. I said, what do you mean he got killed? He said, yeah, he was in this bar, and out of nowhere, Jesus Venezuela, or whatever his name was, came up and shot him, and he's dead. I, I don't know what to do now. I said, how about rewriting the scene? He said, no, I, I can't do that. My guys do what they do. So that was a weird thing for, for me to experience as somebody who can't write, uh, for him to realize that his characters were so real to him that once they behaved badly and, and one of them killed somebody else, that was it. He, he couldn't rewrite that scene. So anyway, so he's sitting in my, in my office and signing a bunch of books. And as I always did with him and other writers who came to the, to the store, uh, I would say, uh, what are you working on? You know, you finished your book, now you're signing books. So obviously uh, you've been working on something because most, most writers, mystery writers especially, do a book a year if they can. Uh, and he said, well, I'm writing this book. It's based on true stuff about uh, German prisoners of war in Oklahoma. And we had a big encampment of POWs that were, that were captured in Germany and flown over and put in this uh, POW camp in Oklahoma. I need, a, I need a good name for a German. What's a good name for a German? And I said, how about Otto? And he said, Otto, Otto Penzler. Yeah, I like that. His next book was uh, serialized in the New York Times 
and it was called Comfort to the Enemy. And one of the major characters was SS Sturmbannführer Otto Penzler. So I was uh, in, in after Otto Penzler in his book, not, not I, um, was serving with Rommel in Africa when I was captured and brought there. And, he, and as, as he talked about it uh, later, he said, oh, you know, you just escaped from the POW camp in Oklahoma. <laughs> I said, why would I do that? These guys were in a POW camp. They're getting three meals a day. They're not freezing to death on the Russian front. They have food. They're warm. Why would anybody escape? He said, they're German, just to show that they could. <laughs> so, uh, so he that's the scene that he wrote. And I was one of the people who left. And it was common, apparently, in real life. They did escape. They got into town and went to a bar and got a beer before they got arrested again and brought back to the camp. And the bartender always knew who they were, of course, because they had German accents. Or, but they said, beer, bitter. <laughs> so, and, but they would get arrested immediately without major consequences, apparently. Then uh, he wrote another book later, and I became a character again uh, in Up in Honey's Room. Uh, and uh, in, in the book, I become, I marry a Jewish girl, and we open a bookshop together. <laughs> That's Elmo Leonard. Thank you. Hey, uh, really quickly, we have a couple of those westerns in the case out there. Do you want to look at those? Oh, I forgot about those. Excuse me. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, I just totally forgot. Uh, they were paper, the, the Westerns were all paperback originals. And, uh, oh, here's the British edition of Gold Coast. I showed you the paperback original, and here's the British edition, which was done in a very small quantity and uh, is pretty expensive. It's, it's a perfect copy, $450. Uh, but the really rare books uh, was when Ballantyne uh, or Houghton Mifflin were publishing his, his uh, Westerns as paperback originals. For the library market, they did about 500 copies in hardcover <clears throat> of The Law at Redondo, es Escape from Five Shadows. Uh, I, I'm sure there was also uh, Ombre, and I'm sure there was uh, 310 to Yuma. Um, and these really are expensive. This is twenty five hundred dollars, and uh, and the um, Escape from Five Shadows, seventeen fifty. Even though it's inscribed on the title page, which makes it very much very desirable, but it's not a perfect copy. It has some state tape stains here, and uh, if it's not a perfect copy, you can see that there's tape stains on the inside of the dust jacket as well. So the price comes down quite a bit because of it isn't a perfect copy. So if anybody is a Leonard completist, you won't find these thick on the ground, as the Brits say. Thank you very much.